I now need to welcome UAF Chancellor Steve Jones to the front of the room. He's going to be providing tonight's introduction. Chancellor. Good. Thanks, Amy. If, you're, if your phone rings with an infrasound tone, you may leave it on. It's, it's my pleasure and really pl privilege to introduce Dr. Kurt Saberla. Kurt is an assistant professor of physics at UAF's Geophysical Institute. He came here as a Ph.D. student and is a 1986 engineering physics grad from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. He served as an airborne and ranger qualified infantry instructor, um, officer that is, and he taught physics and math right here at North Pole High School for eight years. And we're so proud that he's now on our faculty. At GI, he's helped build an internationally recognized infrasound research program known as the Wilson Infrasound Observatories. Before I ask him to come up here and talk to you this evening, I have to relate quickly my own infrasound sensor experiences. When we've lived in places where thunderstorms are frequent, Many, many nights, as thunderstorms apparently approached, I was awakened by something and went to the window before the thunder was actually audible. I've contended for years that I have an infrasound sensor within me. My wife has refuted it from the very beginning, and perhaps Kurt can weigh in on this domestic <laughs> feud that we've had for years. So again, help me welcome Kurt Saberla. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Chancellor Jones. Um, I won't weigh in on that until after I'm tenured. Then I'll let you know what I think of the, uh, the infrasound sensor built in. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for showing up tonight. Uh, some colleagues and some former colleagues from the high schools that I recognize around and the schools in the district. Uh, this is a real treat for me to get to share with you some of the excitement that I have for the work that I do and the people that I work with who definitely also have very much helped in build our program at UAF in infrasound, which is a topic that's not usually something that rolls off of everybody's lips. But uh, this is great where I get to share this excitement because at work, we all do this. This is what we do every day. When I get home, my wife probably really doesn't want to hear that much about what I do every day in infrasound. She's somewhere out there, perhaps maybe not even listening to this right now. But uh, it's great that you're here. I really appreciate you coming. So hopefully by the end of this, you'll have some idea of what we do do with this. Uh, little title slide there, but mainly couldn't do this without the help of a lot of people. And the staff there, if you notice, as the picture changed, even though it was a couple of years difference, we apparently all stand in the same places, but this is the group I work with and have worked with because some of these people have moved on to other things. There's graduate students in there. There's one of my former high school students who now is one of my undergrad research interns. Uh, we have a PhD student there, the guy in the green shirt, just recently graduated with his doctorate. It's the first infrasound doctorate at UAF since the uh, 70s when Buck Wilson, who we named the observatories after, had him. Uh, Several colleagues there, some are retired, some are not retired, some are close to retired. Uh, we have some interns there from in the lower 48 as well through a, an NSF program that we run. So we at times, depending on how many people show up for our group meetings, claim that we have the largest infrasound group in the world. About 50% of the time that's actually true. We have, we have quite a large group that does this. And the reason why we, we have this is because there's a lot of history at UAF behind this. But First of all, just what is infrasound? Uh, in the, the abstract for the talk, I said it's very much like infrared light. Although it's not light, it's, it's acoustic energy. But like infrared is below your range of detection with your eyes, 
Infrasound is sound that's at frequencies below what you can normally hear. Now, what you can normally hear depends on how many rock concerts you went to, uh, how many mortar ranges you stood at in the army, or how old you are. The older you get, the narrower your range of hearing gets. So I, I have a slide up here that's actually of a piano keyboard, and voila, I happen to have a piano here. So uh, somewhere on this thing is like concert A, which is, I think, here. But that thing, most of us in here can hear a note like that. Now, the piano keyboard, especially on a Bosendorfer Grand, which this isn't, goes down a bunch lower. And there's overtones to be sure on this, but the fundamental on this is down near the limit of what you're actually able to hear. We can hear from about 20 hertz to about 20,000 hertz. And what that means is that the air molecules vibrate back and forth either 20 times a second or 20,000 times a second. That seems like a lot, but when we were younger, we had about that kind of hearing range. When you're my age, in your mid-40s, it starts to drop off a bit, maybe around 12 or 14 kilohertz is the highest I can hear on the high end, and even the low end rolls up slightly, so that some things you can't hear. And in fact, I think right now, yes, I'm getting thumbs up from my engineers back there, is that while you're sitting here right now, you're immersed in an infrasound tone right now that I really doubt anybody in here can hear unless they're an elephant, giraffe, or rhinoceros. So uh, he's been, yeah. <laughs> Chancellor Jones is acting all fidgety. He knew something was going on. But right now, the, and if you get a chance to look at this later, please do, that uh, Jay has a large subwoofer for the Duncan built back there. Uh, it's going and it's driving at about five to eight hertz, something in that. Now, I, I'm getting thumbs up, so I'm, I'm speaking the truth. So that's driving right now. It's not something you can hear. If they drove the amplitude up after a while, you'd start to feel it because you'd feel certain resonances in your body. But as I show up there that some animals have communication that's way off the high end of what we can hear, and those would be bats, uh, and the acoustics underwater like dolphins, they also go beyond 50 kilohertz, which is more than double what we're able to hear. On the other end of things, elephants think large, large chest cavity, really deep tones, like a baritone singer, um, or like a bass guitar. Bass guitars are longer because they have lower frequencies than do short, regular rhythm guitars or a lead guitar. Um, giraffes, same thing. Uh, a friend of mine, actually, a colleague from the Netherlands, actually got to bring an elephant onto a TV show to do an infrasound gig. So the, uh, the things that you can hear range all over the place, but just to give you an idea of the upper end of things, we can only hear about two octaves above that. In other words, double the frequency each time. That's about where our hearing cuts off. So I'm going to talk about the low end of things. And what, Jay, if you could just turn that up and sweep it, you'll hear what it sounds like to go from infrasound to what is just barely detectable on the low end of hearing. And if you'll notice there, it goes from rumbling, where you're actually really not hearing the infrasound anymore. What you're going to start to hear is you're going to start to hear resonances in the building. In other words, the building's going to start shaking. Uh, you go through a point there where the wavelength actually starts to match parts of the hall here, so that you end up with an effective amplification of the sound that's playing there. So we won't just do annoying tones all night. We'll try and do a bunch of things, but let's ask ourselves a fundamental question. Why would we bother studying things we can't hear anyway? So this is uh, what I constantly have to justify to our funding agencies for, but let's just say we take and place a sensor in, let's say, 1971 at Stevens Village. And that's actually a picture of a current infrasound sensor. And over in Lopnor, which is the Chinese nuclear test site, it's the equivalent of our Nevada test site, you have an explosion. Now those red paths there, what they are is the sound propagating directly to us along a great circle path. Now, it, it was a few seconds there, but that sound from Lop Nord directly to Stevens Village takes about 14 hours because sound only travels at about 300 meters per second. 
or it takes a few seconds or five seconds with Chancellor Jones and his thunderclap to flash to thunderclap times there. It takes about five seconds to go a mile. So going the other way, we actually, when I say we, I was in first grade at this time, so it wasn't me, it was uh, Buck Wilson, but the antipodal path, the great circle route going the other direction around the globe, took about 23 hours to go around. But again, the sounds were recorded again there. Early in history, the uh, explosions at Krakatoa, those things circled the globe many, many times. So one reason we study infrasound is that if I was to uh, start yelling without the aid of this microphone and would start walking outside further and further away from you, I'd tend to get quieter and quieter, and eventually, no matter how hard I yelled, you wouldn't be able to hear me anymore. The sound would start to fall off because it would, what we call attenuate, it would just be turned down in volume as it went through the atmosphere. Infrasound, however, can travel for hundreds and even thousands of kilometers. And by the way, I apologize, everything I say is going to be in metric tonight, so the, uh, just bear with me. But here's an example of how the sound travels through the atmosphere in terms of a model of it. Now, what you're about to see here on this blue panel down here is a theoretical simulation for not a Chinese test at Lop Nor, because that was back in the analog days, but actually a gas explosion, a chemical gas plant at Bunsfield uh, in Central Europe. And what this is, it shows how the energy propagates through the atmosphere. And on the vertical scale there, there's no numbers on it, but it goes from about zero to 120 kilometers. And just keep that number in mind because that's about the same height in the ballpark, plus or minus about 30 kilometers, that the aurora is as well. So you'll watch sound energy here propagate or through the atmosphere, and notice it goes up and it starts coming back down after a while, and then it starts to get locked into channels. And those channels it gets locked into there, the upper channel is from about 40 or 50 kilometers on up to about 120 kilometers, that's the thermosphere, and then the bottom channel is what's called a stratospheric duct. And the reason it does that is because the sound speed is not constant throughout the atmosphere. Uh, the temperature as you rise up, generally starts to get warmer, but eventually it starts to fall off again, then gets warmer again at the stratosphere, cools off down to about minus 80 Celsius, and that's pretty darn cold, colder than it ever gets here in Fairbanks, and then warms up again as you head out. Once you head out that high in the atmosphere, above 120 kilometers, the energy would just dissipate out into space and you'd, you'd actually lose all the sound energy. But what also happens in there, you notice, is that initial blast tends to leave some ground uncovered. So you may actually be near a source of infrasound and not be able to hear it very well because there's what's called a shadow zone on the ground. So this property of the atmosphere, the fact that the temperature is not constant, helps duct the energy. We call them wave guides. It keeps the energy near the ground. And again, it can propagate for very, very long distances where it can propagate practically over the entire planet. You're going to see in a bit there that the nuclear explosion is actually, <laughs> I'm going to say it's a good thing, but it's something that helped drive our research and helped us get going with what we're doing today at UAF. So early infrasonic research. I, we always love showing this slide. It's actually courtesy of a colleague of mine from the Netherlands again, and it's actually not a joke that that, that is a real photograph of someone during World War I uh, with, essentially, something that would magnify audible sound energy, not quite infrasound, to get it into the ears for what it was used for initially was World War I artillery locations, counter-battery fire. In other words, if you know where the enemy is firing their guns, you can direct your guns to fire on them. Um, it was also used for aircraft flight detections, in other words, when aircraft would take off. Uh, in fact, special microphones were developed for it. And then shortly after World War II, uh, the, you notice there is no World War II up there, actually, and that's because the battlefield was too mobile in World War II. Uh, we went away from static trench line warfare to mobile warfare. Infrasound emplacements tend to need to be there, and the enemy needs to tend to be there for a while for it to work. Now, in the digital age, we can change that around, but the next resurgence of infrasound research was actually with the atomic age. And again, when I say think of big things like elephant chest cavities, if you think of big, big firecrackers, like nukes, they make tremendous amounts of infrasound. Uh, there's a Russian colleague of ours, every time he shows up at a meeting, it's great, 
because he flips down overheads still, transparencies. He hasn't let, yet learned death by PowerPoint. And this guy, Sergei Kulichkov, always has really nice graphs of actual Russian nuclear tests that he's showing us every time. So what happened then was, after about World War II into the 50s, is that people started to notice geophysical interference. And this is the thing where one man's signal is another man's noise. Uh, some folks at AT&T Labs uh, won a Nobel Prize for finding out what some noise was. Turns out it was the echoes of the Big Bang. Uh, I don't expect to win any Nobel Prizes out of this. I don't think anybody in our group's gonna, but that's okay. Um, the deal is, is that there's a lot of rich information out there in the infrasound band that we can't hear, but as Buck Wilson, who we named our observatories after, said, when you put sensitive instruments out in nature, oftentimes you discover new things that you had no idea were there. And these infrasound sensors that we now build in-house are just that. Microbarums, those are signals generated from marine storms. Our array in Alaska and the one down in Antarctica, we actually listen for storms out in the Gulf of Alaska. In fact, some colleagues at University of Mississippi now are using it to track things like Hurricane Katrina. Not that Katrina's coming back, but hurricanes out in the Gulf of Mexico. Infrasound can be used to track and predict where they're going. Um, Mountain-associated waves. Little bit of a non-sexy type of research. You're essentially listening for a mountain range that you already know is there, but it can help characterize the atmosphere. Uh, volcanoes and earthquakes, those are always particularly sexy subjects. And then for us at the Institute, where we're one of the world's premier research institutions for auroral work, aurora generate infrasound. And I'll talk about that more towards the end of the talk here. Okay, so what are we doing these days in infrasound research? The camps are divided into two worlds. One is what traditional science does, and that is basic research. It's money you get from taxpayers that is not directed at a particular outcome. In other words, we're going to study this phenomena, we're going to try and find something more and deeper understanding of nature. It's not necessarily you need to build this widget and this widget needs to work. That's what basic research is. Applied research is the other side of the world where they want a widget, they want a product out of it. We tread, not lightly, we tread heavily in both these camps. Um, the basic research side is things that our institute does very well. Um, we're not so heavy in the acoustics world, but we do that with our infrasound group. On the applied research side, you see that most of the stuff up there deals with national security sorts of issues. So you can imagine where the interest comes from there. You know, when you say nukes, you're naturally going to get military involvement in it. But again, these days, there's a paucity of nuclear signals. One joke we have at some of our meetings is that they ought to just put the treaty off for a couple of years so that we can just test like crazy and see if this technology actually works really well. Okay, we also do a bunch of digital signal processing and a lot of sensor design. And later, hopefully you'll stop back there and see one of the sensors in action. So, this, I showed you who we are, this is who everybody else is. That picture there is pretty much everybody on the planet who does infrasound research. Uh, we happened to host them. I got the, the honor of hosting the, the Infrasound Technology Workshop, which is an annual gathering. This was up at the Institute back in uh, September of 06. And that's everybody right there. There's only about two or three people gone. Um, they're from 13 different countries. About 70 people show up. The nice thing about it is, when I used to work in space physics, was the, the community was huge. You wouldn't know every single person with this. I know most of these people by their first name, and they're all my friends. I, in fact, we had 70 of our closest friends up to the house for that meeting and had a little gathering at the house that my wife was kind enough to cater for us. But the, uh, everybody there ranges from the U.S. military, uh, U.S. diplomatic corps from the State Department, and also you have folks, uh, let's see, the Chinese were denied their visas, but it wasn't the U.S.'s fault, it was their fault. Um, You've got people from the Azores there. You've got people from the International Organization in Vienna. It's all over the map. Uh, a guy from Kazakhstan there. We, uh, we give him a lot of ribbing, especially after the Borat movie, but he's, he's okay with it. So the, uh, the big players in this game, actually, the leaders of the field are both ourselves at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and the French. That's the big guns in the field. The rest of the U.S. team, which also does very well, is University of Mississippi, University of Hawaii, and UCSD in San Diego. So that's the gang that I work with on the international scale and also the folks in-house. Now, 
I can't really talk about what we do without referencing the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. This is our bread and butter. It's what feeds my technical food chain and what keeps me alive financially quite a bit as well. And it's also where we rebuilt our reputation in infrasound. And it's not that our reputation was sullied or lost, it's just that infrasound was a technology from the analog days that started to just fall off in interest. In other words, it became an ancillary instrument to seismic instruments, um, video and satellite imagery of volcanoes. Infrasound was sort of pushed aside. The CTBTO is what gave a big resurgence to infrasound research in the digital age. Because the goal of the treaty is to be able to detect any test, one kiloton or above, anywhere on the planet with two or more technologies and three or more stations. So this web of little circles and dots, et cetera, and squares up there is the various technologies. There's four ways you would pick up a nuclear detonation. One is you'd have seismic instruments. That's the backbone of the system. There's several hundred seismic systems there. The next one is you'd want radionuclide detectors. In other words, you want the smoking gun. You want radioactive particles that drift through the atmosphere and get to you. Seismic instruments, they're great. Seismic sounds travel very, very quickly through solid Earth, so the signal's there in a few minutes. Radioactive particles take days or weeks for the winds to blow them around. So you need other technologies because there are ways to detonate in the atmosphere clandestinely, enter infrasound. Also then you could say, well, let's just blow them up in the ocean. We got hydroacoustic or sonar down there to cover it. So the technologies are designed. That whole grid of sensors there, they were already there for the seismic stuff. That wasn't that big a deal. Of course, I'm not a seismologist, so I don't think it's that big a deal. There's other large seismic webs out there. As far as infrasound goes, this was the first time we had a worldwide infrasound network. It's about three quarters of the way installed. It's gonna be about 80% installed at the end, maybe 90. The other 10% of the stations are in political limbo because they're too expensive to build or China doesn't want them there. Or This is where it gets really interesting for me personally is that I came from the military so I know how to speak to those guys. I know how to talk to the boots on the ground. I was a boot on the ground at one point. So the military's involved with this. I'm a scientist now, that's the hat I put on these days. So I know how to talk to scientists. There's politicians and diplomats involved with this and from out of the country as well. So, uh, which is, you know, I, I have a hard enough time tucking my shirt in. When I go to DC for these meetings, I actually have to put on a choking tie and a monkey suit to, uh, to go speak with diplomats because that's casual wear for those guys. So it's, it's a real eye opener for me in that I get to talk to many different worlds. And the treaty is interesting in and of itself because the treaty is actually not in force yet. This is still the preparatory commission for this thing because there's 10 nations in Annex 2 that have to ratify the treaty before it can go into force. Now, this is kind of interesting because those 10 nations are some that you would guess and some that you might not guess. And here's the holdouts. The axis of evil, um, they won't sign it. India and Pakistan, they like testing too much. And the cool part is we're the actual 10th holdout. We won't ratify the treaty, which is kind of interesting. So we, we have some strange bedfellows there. India and Pakistan, they haven't signed it. That's what the, uh, the circles is, because you either sign it and then you ratify it. The United States has signed it, but has not ratified it. Now, you may say, well, why the heck are we spending money on this stuff? And the deal is that the US wants their fingers in the pie. This is a monitoring technology that has geopolitical significance. We're definitely gonna keep playing this game. At one point, actually, though, Trent Lott wrote a memo, which was signed by, he was then the majority leader in the Senate, four other senior Republican senators sent to Donald Rumsfeld, then Secretary of Defense, saying, need we remind you that the full Senate voted down the CTBT. We urge you, or actually it was direct, we direct you to terminate all funding. Well, we said, hey, you know, that was, that was fun. It was uh, the same day we had just been announced that we were gonna install a station at Fairbanks. Well, it was fun while it lasted, we'll go home. President Bush, at a meeting, turned to Donald Rumsfeld and said, leave all of the CTBT funding alone. So we've been pretty well funded on this. Um, it's not, uh, you know, we're not sure how long it's gonna go because now the, the arrays are out there. So now we go into sort of an operation and maintenance mode, but 
I don't think that the U.S. is going to ratify anytime soon because they're going to wait until someone like China, which has also signed. India and Pakistan, though, they like testing. In fact, they're the last powers on Earth that have tested nuclear weapons. The French, I think, have the best sense of humor. They tested the last above-ground nuke, other than the Indian and Pakistanis, the day before they ratified the treaty. So I thought that was pretty fun. All right, here's what the infrasound is going to look like. We've got two stations that are our own. Uh, UAF, we have a station in our backyard. I'll show you what that looks like. And we also operate and maintain one down in Windless Bight, Antarctica. I'll also show you what that looks like. A little bit later on, I'm going to be taking over the management of all the U.S. infrasound stations, which means everything along the uh, coast of the U.S., out in Hawaii, and uh, a couple others scattered around. Now, some of these stations are in pretty bad places. Like uh, two years ago, I had to go to a meeting in Tahiti for a station. I had to go to a meeting in Tasmania for one of those stations. Um, this year, I only went to Japan, which wasn't that exciting because it was fall there. But uh, there's, some, there's some good places. It was exciting for people to come to Fairbanks, actually, because that was, that was an unusual place. But the white dots haven't been built yet. Uh, if you're interested in doing this kind of work, they're still looking for someone to build Bermuda. It's just they're trying to come up with the million bucks for the footprint for the station right now. Here's our station down Windless Bight. This is Ross Island. Uh, the north is at the top of the map. The continent of Antarctica is to the south, to the bottom. It's actually connected to the continent of Antarctica by the ice shelf there. Um, that's out on the Ross Ice Shelf, and it's about 14 miles away from McMurdo Station. Uh, if you saw the movie Eight Below, there was actually one scene in there that was from McMurdo, and it was the medical station. Everything else was in British Columbia or Greenland. So we got to go down here. Uh, there's an overhead view of what it looks like. The infrasound array that is where the microphones are, it's that pentagram and the triangle there. We have eight sensors, and I'll talk to you a little bit later about why we put them out like that, but McMurdo's about 14 miles that way. It's a really good ski there. Um, it's the ice shelf. We're sitting on about 100 meter thick ice, so a football field thick of sea ice, or sorry, continental ice over ocean. So there's actually ocean underlying that. And then we have a really nice signal generator, Mount Erebus, which is conveniently located. Pretty tall mountain, a little over 12,000 feet. Uh, it constantly is emitting sounds, burping lava, throwing lava rocks out, etc. So it's a good thing for us. And also the ice calves out there as well. This is my first impression of it, what I thought it was going to be like, and that's me standing there. That was actually the only day where it was cloudy. There's our power supply. This is Duncan, one of our technicians, calibrating a sensor. Um, there's Duncan, the he-man, heaving out the thing. They get buried by snow every year, so we have to go down. That's our affectionately known as Bob power supply. Uh, yeah, and it's not all work down there. We get to ski. As I said, there's you know, 600,000 miles of square miles of ungroomed trails out there. And also, we get the occasional visitors out there, little Adelie penguins. They make great snacks. No, the, uh... Actually, you can't even... If they come up to you, you can't even move. You have to wait until they leave by treaty. You're not allowed to interfere with the wildlife there at all. Those suckers actually... I mean, they're little tiny penguins, but they go a long ways. Our site is 14 miles from the nearest open water. They walk all the way out there. In fact, they walk all the way around Ross Island. So the, uh, let me see if I can go back to a picture, maybe not. Okay, so much for that. That power supply out there, there's no phone lines, no cables out there. So that orange box is about half of a tractor trailer. That has two marine diesel engines in it that run while the sun's down and also solar panels on it. That's where our power comes from. We really have a hard life out there because we actually have wireless internet out there as well now. Antarctica is not as far away as it used to be. I called my dad for his birthday from the place. Okay, a uh, little bit less exciting a locale. This is up on the West Ridge of campus. Um, this is where the array is. Same basic sort of design, five outer microphones, about two kilometers across, and some sensors in the center there. And again, I'll talk about why they're there. This is just a close-up of what's going on there. The, uh, you may ask, what's the spider web of pipe they're doing in the woods? Have you ever seen, like on the side of an NFL game, they have those parabolic mics that are aiming in? but they always have foam over the microphone pieces. Or a reporter talking out in the wind has foam around it. That's the same thing. It's a wind-reducing system. The foam breaks up turbulence right near the microphone that you'd speak into. That doesn't break the turbulence up, but it has a larger scale size than the turbulence, so it reduces the wind noise, because wind for us is indeed noise. Uh, the sensors sit in those vaults. Uh, we don't have too much trouble. In fact, we have no trouble in Fairbanks, really, with those things, but colleagues of ours in California their sensors occasionally get shot by deer hunters. Um, they like uh, target practice out there. So 
Here's, here's an example where you're finally going to get to hear something other than me yakking about this, and that you'll get to hear some infrasound, uh, and not just the stuff that Jay's going to play back there. This is an event that was an avalanche of Mount Stellar, which, as you saw there, was some 500 kilometers to the south-southeast of Fairbanks. What happened was about 15 million cubic meters of rock and snow gave way and avalanched nine kilometers out into the valley floor. That's a heck of a lot of rock to go down. That makes a big sound. The seismic sensors picked it up really well, but also there's some traces. I think everyone's seen enough shows these days where they know what bumps and wiggles look like. That's the sound. Here, I'll actually play a couple of these things. This is just a different way of looking at the sound, and that is this is in the frequency domain. So this is what's called a spectrogram. Won't get into it. Just time is going along there. The higher up on it is, it's the... Uh, the higher the frequency. And if you can see some dark red about two-thirds of the way down on the low end there, that's the rumbling that we heard from Mount Stellar. Okay, and we're 500 kilometers away from that thing, so here is what it sounded like. Everybody hear that? going by there. That's a Doppler shifted thing. Um, channel 4, which is the bottom panel there, that stuff that's up high there looks like stripes or someone scratched the panel. That's an aircraft going overhead of sensor 4. So that's what that was. Now, this is partly used for an example of infrasound in and of itself is really not that exciting. We don't sit in the lab and sit there with headphones on and go, oh man, this is great. We really hear some good things. We let computers do that grudge work for us, but every now and then it's nice to hear these things. If, if that was in real time, even that aircraft going by, you would not have heard that. Because if you look on the top panel there, it's up to 10 hertz. That's twice below what you can actually detect with your ears, even if you were young and had perfect hearing. I sped that thing up 200 times to be able to make it audible. In other words, I shifted it up in frequency quite a bit so that you could actually hear it. But Infrasound itself, the sounds mostly sound like noise. The aircraft actually sounds like something nice because a lot of man-made activity sounds like something that uh, you can actually hear and recognize. For instance, if you listen to an infrasound recording of an aircraft taking off sped up, it sounds like you're listening to an aircraft through a pipe. It's because we use a wind-reducing array. We're listening to the sound of those, that wind-reducing array. But that's what, that's what a general infrasound signal looks like. So here's the next big question, is we have data coming in in infrasound from everything. It is noisy out there in the infrasound world. How do we deal with it? We've got earthquakes, glaciers. Uh, actually, that glacier avalanche up there, that was after the big magnitude 7.9 earthquake spilled out onto the Black Rapids Glacier. Um, the aurora makes infrasound, explosions make it, aircraft make it, we're right near the airport. How do we cope with all this? We do a lot of digital signal processing. So I know you're all up for a whole bunch of math tonight. So this is the one slide you're never ever supposed to show to a public audience, and that is the one that has equations on it. Well, we're not gonna deal with the equations, but what I'm gonna show you is that in these packages you came equipped with, you have better signal processing software than we'll ever create at the Institute. And we've actually done quite a bit. We have two patents, actually, on signal processing software that we've done for UAF. So what I'm going to play here is a tone that I've got to turn this down or else I'm going to deafen half the audience here. And that is, all right, this should be okay. All right. <laughs> Who's ever lost like one of those darn greeting cards that has really high-pitched tones or you have a high-pitched tone playing in the house and you're looking all over for it and cannot find it? The same thing with that sound is if you were going to close your eyes and try and find where it is, you got these fleshy appendages on your head that help distinguish forwards and backwards, but it's very difficult to localize things like that. In fact, mathematically, we could show you that you can't because your ears are spaced about 15 centimeters apart and sound travels at about 330 meters per second. Turn a little bit of an algebra crank in there. What happens is anything above about one kilohertz or stuff that vibrates back and forth a thousand times per second, anything above that, you really can't localize anymore. So it's that you can hear it, but you can't find out where it is. So what I'm gonna ask you to do now is, I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes for a second, and I'm gonna give you a sound that you can localize, and I'm gonna tick off the cameraman because I'm gonna walk out of the light here, but uh, go ahead and close your eyes.
And I'm sure most of you could tell that I had moved over here. And the difference was, is that sound when I clapped my hands wasn't a continuous tone. It was a sound that has a lot of frequency content, both in the high end and the low end. And what happens is, your head's really good at determining which ear got struck first. So you can start to determine right and left. Now your hearing is a lot more complicated than that because what you're able to do as well is you're able to make frequency judgments if you know what the sound was supposed to sound like. You can tell if it's before you or in front of you, sorry, in front of you or behind you because your ears actually mute some frequencies coming from behind and focus some frequencies coming from the front. That little bit of signal processing to tell which direction did it come from, that's all that mathematics up there. Then another thing we do is with that little cone diagram there is we can look at sources that are very much in the near field, and that's actually where we have our patented software, is that better than anybody else on the planet, we can tell you where something happened, particularly in the infrasound. So another thing that you guys can do very, very well is what's called the cocktail party problem. Okay, now I wish I had some, actually I wish I had a beer, but the, uh, it'd be nice if we had cocktails out here for everybody, it'd definitely loosen up the audience, but what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to turn to your neighbor, and when I tell you to go, I'd like everybody to say your name rather loudly to your neighbor, simultaneously, everybody at once, three times. Okay, ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Okay, uh, all I heard was, uh, I, I heard nothing. Were most of you able to actually hear what your neighbor was saying? Some were, some weren't. Okay, so some of you have better signal processing packages upstairs than others. If you were able to hear it, typically when you're, when you're in a crowd of people, you know, it's like the thing with the penguins, where how can they recognize their, you know, little penguin's voice? Well, we don't speak penguin, and we don't know the nuances of penguin frequencies. But generally, if you're speaking to someone in a crowd, you know, sometimes you can't hear them because there's too much going on. They may speak at the wrong pitch. But this is a really big problem for us, is that a lot of events all have the same frequency content and happen at the same time and come from a lot of different directions. Your brain, it turns out, is incredibly sophisticated at dealing with, I'm going to focus in on this, and I'm not going to pay attention to anything else. Okay? To write that down in code in a computer is actually very, very difficult. It's not an easy problem to do. Uh, what we're actually doing these days is where one of my grad students is using neural nets to do that. In other words, you effectively design a fake brain on a computer to be able to weed out those sounds. So you guys have much more ability than most computational devices do to do these things. Okay, so another infrasound source here. This is Augustine Volcano which is down about 200 kilometers to the south of Anchorage. It's a nice thing because it's a decadal eruptor. It erupts every 10-ish sort of years, although it did skip a bit, skip 1996, but did go off again in 2000, had gone off before in 86, 76, uh, 63 to 64, dot, 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 on back there. It's a great volcano to study. It sends up, as you saw in one of those pictures, an ash plume. Ash plumes are hazards to aircraft. Well, it turns out that using seismometers to detect when an eruption actually occurred is really not a good thing because volcanoes have lots of seismic activity all the time. It's not a good predictor or even determiner of eruptions. Infrasound, it turns out, has some really good techniques and properties for being able to tell when a volcano went off. Now, the thing is, you may not always have eyes in the sky on it. You may have cloud-obscured satellite images. Although actually one Augustine eruption was cool, it was signaled to us back from the space shuttle. As it flew over, they said, oh wow, there's a giant ash plume coming off that volcano there off the uh, Kenai Peninsula. <laughs> so word got back to us, we looked, sure enough, hey, there was infrasound in there. Uh, we're actually in the process of preparing a paper about the 13 decadal eruptions from 2006 from this. What we have here is, you remember that simulation that I showed where it showed the wave energy going through the atmosphere and being trapped? What you've got here is, at about 40 kilometers, you have those rays. Now picture this, that a sound wave goes out and it spreads and it's really just air molecules coming together and going apart. But you can make a simplification for it, which is called ray theory. And it's not quite like shooting a beam of light, but it is. It bends as it goes. It what's called refracts. And it's because of the, the various temperatures in the atmosphere. 
is that up around 40 kilometers height there, we get one turning over of the wave. Now, if we put our infrasound sensors out in Anchorage, Anchorage is about 200 kilometers away from the volcano, notice no sound gets to the ground at 200. It's in a shadow zone. There's nothing there. We happen to be at the far end of that graph over there, about 675 kilometers away. We happen to just accidentally be in a perfect place to observe Augustine. And the volcanology group from UAF, the uh, Alaska Volcano Observatory, actually put some of our sensors down on the volcano so we have a source term at the explosion, and we also have the distant one. What that can be used for is it can be used for atmospheric tomography. In other words, we can study the atmosphere with something like a volcano because we know approximately what the yield of the volcano was, which actually acoustically is the best way to estimate that yield. Then we see what energy made it back to Fairbanks. We can start to tell things about the atmosphere and the winds between here and there. So Augustine was an exciting thing for us. We're in a lucky place. We actually have plans in the works to augment the coverage of the ring of fire portion that Alaska has along the Aleutians with another infrasound set of sensors. Now, not everything we see in our data is actually all that fortunate. This was a house fire that was over by uh, a little bit down from Yak Estates over near the university. And what happened was a structure caught fire. Uh, it destroyed the structure, destroyed a couple of vehicles. Fortunately, no people were harmed in the fire. But unfortunately for the homeowners, it was a complete loss of the property. This, it's not a surprise that it makes infrasound, but what this keyed us into was this actually helped us get funding to do something else. And that is we were able to look in our data and say, wow, there's kind of a continuous source of sound coming from this one location. We were able to pin it down. And one of the researchers I work with, Ken Arnold, he took a GPS and drove out to where he predicted it. And voila, there was a burnt house there. So in other words, we're able to localize these sounds because of that patented software we have, which starts to mimic what your head can do, we can now put those onto computers to get this. So let me play you what the sound of a burning house sounds like. Now, this isn't going to sound like what you'd normally think, but if you think of a whole house on fire, big billows of flame. That heating drives air away, and then as the billow collapses, it comes in. You've got a giant radiator of sound there. Okay? If you listen really closely, those sharp spikes in there, that was actually some propane tanks that the neighbors reported blowing up as the fire was going. Oops, gotta turn back. You can see why we don't put headphones on and listen to this all day long. <laughs> it sounds kind of like just noise. But it's not just noise because the noise is correlated. In other words, when you look at those waveforms, the bumps and wiggles, they match up with each other. They have a fingerprint to them that we can distinguish this from other types of noise. And again, it's not our ears that do it. We let the computer do it. But like I said, the fact that we were able to place this fire to right in the middle of the street from where the fire actually occurred, that's actually not an easy thing to do with the array like ours. And it impressed some folks enough that they sent us a nice package of money to go do another experiment that I lovingly called Elvis. And we went down to Fort Greeley to see if Elvis had left the building. And what we did was look at another source of infrasound, and that is blocks of C4 being detonated. Um, you notice the other one had smoking time fuse. I didn't stick around for the time fuse on that one. This is me surveying one of the sensors out in the field. And there's what one infrasound microphone looks like. That's uh, what we call a Model 25. It's a uh, relatively small form factor one. It actually also samples beyond the infrasound, but you notice it looks like there's garden hoses hooked up to that thing. And indeed, those are soaker hoses from probably Home Depot. Although I think actually to do this experiment, we had one of our techs go out and raid every store in town and bought the world's supply of soaker hoses. So if you needed one this summer around August, you probably didn't find it because we bought them all. Those are the wind reducing elements. We stretch those out. Even though the microphone's right here, that's kind of like a big foam surround for the microphone. Uh, the red cable coming in actually just runs about 80 meters up the hill, a football field up the hill to a digitizer, which records the data. Um, the rabbits liked it as well. During the experiment, one of our sensors magically went down. We went down there, and it was one of the snowshoe hares had decided that the red cable tasted good, ate through it, killed the sensor. So we had to do a, well, actually, Jay had to do the field repair out there. But these are the things we drop out in the woods to get these sounds. Now, the, the military was very interested in this. If we can localize sounds like that, 
that's a good thing for them. And here's one of the troops that was supporting us, and actually a big thanks to the, uh, the striker brigade on post because they were very happy to support us. These guys from the 73rd Engineer Company did backflips for us. You name it, I think if we had asked to blow a helicopter up in flight, they probably would have done it for us. I I'm really sorry I didn't ask, but instead we just blew up a lot of stuff on the ground. It was, it was tremendous fun. What was also tremendous fun was the fact that uh, the guys I work with are not ex-military folks, and they were kind of impressed with what this stuff did. Um, this is a recording of a guy I work with, John Olson. Uh, he was up at site number one here, here on a, a hill overlooking the experiment, and this is one of the blast sites. I was actually just out of the view in the picture there, just a little bit around minimum safe distance from a blast like this, and these are John's comments during, the, uh, during one of the runs here. What you'll see to start with is smoking time fuse, what I want you to watch is the delay between the explosion and when you hear the explosion. Uh, that was really pretty short. <laughs> Let's start it at the beginning. Five pounder. And there's the blast. Notice how it took holy a while. Moly. <laughs> John's saying, holy moly. Uh, they were, every one of those blasts, the radio traffic all the time was like, oh my God. Should have been 200 meters away from one of those things. Your entire chest rings. It's, it's really kind of fun. Um, the thing there is that we were able to pin these things down to tremendous precision, better than anybody on the planet can do. So it, it helped us with our funding scenario, that's for sure. And it also is something that we do where normally someone at the Geophysical Institute isn't going to help the troops do something necessarily. But we sort of span a bunch of different worlds where we get to help out in other aspects of life, where by being able to find explosions, you can actually do some things that increase the safety of folks on the ground. So this was a fun experiment. It was a gorgeous day out there in the summer. It was one of those days where you can't believe you're getting paid to do this kind of stuff. So the, the military was happy. The, uh, the Army folks were very happy with it. And the, the guys who had never seen stuff blown up before, they definitely enjoyed it as well. So, the next thing that I'll move on to here is, fortunately, towards the end, and that's the exciting thing, and that is auroral infrasound. Now, what this does is, this is going to tie into something where I will probably get asked the question about, can we hear the aurora? And my answer is yes. If you want to spend about 8,000 bucks or so, head over to Jay after this. He'll be happy to sell you a sensor and a digitizer. <laughs> And if you have a computer, you too can listen to the Aurora. Um, the Audible stuff, actually one of my colleagues over there, Dirk, actually gave a talk about that. I'm not going to talk about that so much, except for maybe some side comments. So I'll let you hear what the Aurora sounds like, and if you've heard the Aurora, you can see if that matches up with it, because this is definitely what the Aurora sounds like. But what happens with the Aurora is that, let me switch over here to another video, is that the Aurora actually it makes tremendous sound. And let's get this back here. You're going to see a bunch of things in this video. You're going to see pulsating aurora. You're going to see auroral arcs moving along. You're also going to see some rockets being launched because this is actually time-lapse photography of the HEX experiment that went on at the only university-operated rocket range in the world, and that is Poker Flat, which UAF runs. So we've got rockets going off. Rockets generate infrasound. Our interest in this was not the same as like Dirk's interest, which was in the Aurora itself. Um, our interest was in the rocket, but that's for other purposes for other people. Um, but as these forms go by, what happens is as the auroral arc moves, it actually generates a supersonic front of heating. And this is a pretty good breakup here with this thing. And you'll see some little sounding rockets go up though there. They just went up. And pretty soon the hex rockets will go off and there we go. And what they're doing is they're setting up TMA, trimethyl aluminum, and they're actually just painting what the neutral winds are doing up there. Okay, and I am not by any stretch of the imagination a role physicist, but the nice thing about it is this event combines a lot of things for our research group in that there's a rural infrasound to be recorded there, and there's also rocket data to be recorded there. So as those fronts move along, 
It's like a very large supersonic object traveling in the atmosphere, and it radiates sound. We actually look at what the shock wave does coming across the ground. It's very, very noisy stuff, and there we go to the end of it. The other thing, though, is that, just rewind it here, is you see these patches that turn on and off. Buck Wilson, back in 1969, actually discovered and confirmed that the aurora does indeed generate infrasound. There was suspicion about it before, so he got funded to put out some instruments in various places around Fairbanks to see if indeed it did do it. They also put them out in other places. They even went down to Palmer, Antarctica for it. But he was able to confirm it there, so Buck was able to discover that. Recently, though, Buck had a suspicion that these patches that turn on and off, that they ought to be generating infrasound too. And this is very new science. We're not even sure that it exactly does it, but currently we just got some funding from the National Science Foundation to go ahead and put our, essentially our theory where our mouth is and see if it actually does do this. So that's very brand new science for infrasound there. And with that, what I'll do is I will go back and if you've heard the aurora, this is what the aurora sounds like during a pulsating aurora patch. It sounds kind of like a jet that can't quite take off. <laughs> Just sitting there idling at the end of the strip. The, the difference here is that that aurora is producing sounds on the very upper end that are about a tenth of a hertz. In other words, they are so far below what you can hear, there's no way you'd be able to hear them. What you heard there was every nine tenths of a second, a half an hour went by. So that's definitely not what you were hearing if you heard the aurora. One other thing is that people who describe the aurora, they say, oh, the arc moved and I heard it move. The aurora is 80 to 90 kilometers up, even at the lower borders where it's moving. Just taking into account the propagation of sound, if you're hearing it, what you're hearing happened about five minutes ago. So if you hear something that's moving exactly in concert with the aurora, you may or may not be hearing the aurora. You're he if you're hearing something, you're hearing it, if it came from up there, five minutes in the past. Sound takes a long time. You saw that John Olson was only 700 meters away from several blocks of C4 going off. It still took three seconds for the sound to get there. And if you work out roughly the sound speed, even taking into account the temperatures up there, at least five minutes to get to the ground. So there's a big delay there. With infrasound, we don't care about five minute delay. That's no big deal for us. We hear it all the time. We like to listen to it. We like to listen to a lot of geophysical things. So I'll exit on Thanking you for your attention, assuming my next slide actually pops up here. Almost. There we go. Thanks for your attention. I enjoyed sharing with you what I do for a living because I have a tremendous amount of fun doing it. Can't wait to get up in the morning to go to work. I may not get there sometimes till 10 o'clock, but I still can't wait to get up. So uh, if you have any questions, thank you, and I'll be happy to entertain them. I guess they pass a microphone around at first, and then... Myself and Jay will be staying for a little bit over there with some of the equipment. Thanks a lot. Are you talking about when the aircraft crashed or? Well, yeah, but after that, for, they were banned for about, a, I guess it was a week. There was, there was oh, you're talking long. about during the ground stop after September 11th. Right. Did that, did that give you guys uh, did, any opportunity of good? To result? tell you the truth, for us, all it was was just that the airport noise was gone. But in terms of other aircraft, it's been when, uh, when aircraft hit the ground that that's something that happens. Also, we get reports out of the public affairs offices, out of uh, Eielson and Wainwright, and that if aircraft are flying supersonically, that also generates quite the infrasound burst as well as the audible one that we can usually tell with the array if they were doing it close to Fairbanks whether they have, uh, have actually exceeded the sound barrier or not. We have a question back here, over to your left. Yes, somewhere Hi, in the light. Hi, do you think you'd be able to use that to pinpoint forest fires? Um, forest fires, yes, as long as they were small. The problem with most forest fires is that they usually have a very broad burn line. So in other words, it's a distributed source. Most of the things we look at are what we call point sources. In other words, they're very small relative to the distance they are from the array. But I know what you're talking about. We've actually been approached by it a couple of times about, can you help do this? Generally, it's that the fire gets a little too large. 
So one of the problems is it's that problem of where did it come from? We get sort of nonsense where we don't even get a band saying it could be over here, you know, in between this range. It'll just be, it'll confound our routines. There are ways, however, to say, I'm going to selectively listen to a particular area. It's actually how your cell phones work and can contact the tower because the tower narrows a beam on the cell phone. We can actually, what we call, beam steer the array. And we actually don't take our array and turn it around. What we do is we electronically tune the array to only give credence to sounds coming from a particular direction. So in terms of a forest fire, about the only thing we could help with is if it did something different drastically off to the sides. Then we'd be able to help out. I'm heading there, sir. Or ma'am. Is your work connected at all to the museum and the room where you go to listen? The, the place where you go to listen, I was involved with the design of that with John Luther Adams and with, uh, with Tom Erb and also Jim Altieri, who we together built the place where you go to listen. Infrasound, unfortunately, at the time, because this was part of nuclear treaty monitoring stuff, the U.S. was not giving free access to the data. That has since changed, and so now if they wanted to incorporate it, if we were doing it today, it would be part of it. But at the time, no. The, the other little bit of a problem, too, is you'd have to speed stuff up so much, it would be really hard to do in real time. Is there any other, are there any other questions out there? We have one up front here. Yes, about 35 years ago, uh, I know there were there's one infrasonic site near Smith Lake, and there was another one uh, out near uh, Fairbanks International Airport that consisted of a, a row of microphones about um, 100 meters long. And are, are these in use anymore? Those particular ones, no. But uh, if, if it was a long or a string of microphones, they may indeed have been doing actually a, a, an acoustics experiment in the audible band as well. Um, the earlier ones that were laid out by Buck Wilson actually had very, very long steel pipes. And in fact, uh, you saw in that one photo of Duncan Marriott pulling out, it's a big actual piece of fuel hose we use out there in Antarctica as our wind reducing array. The old ones were they used to have to get equipment and drag 600 feet of pipe out that they had tried to trench out by hand. Uh, quite some work. In fact, uh, Dan Osborne, who's sitting somewhere out here, and Buck Wilson used to do that backbreaking work. And in fact, uh, I think he's got a pretty funny story about being rescued one time. The, uh, the, the deal is, is that now we go with a little bit lighter materials, but the, the multiple microphone thing doesn't sound like an infrasound experiment to me, though. It would just be... No, I, I surveyed him for Buck Wilson. I, oh, I okay. surveyed him for Buck Wilson, and then I, I stand wonder if they're still uh, using them. Okay. No, they are not in use anymore. There are remnants of them out in the woods that you can still see. The data is still being used, actually. We've got one back here. Sure. Is any of the work that, that you do uh, have application to the ongoing debate between the Navy and environmental groups about the effect of, I'm going to say it wrong, low frequency testing that the Navy's doing and the effect on the, mammals? The sonar channels. No, actually not. Um, it turns out that uh, infrasound can be used underwater for some pretty interesting effects. Um, the, the stuff you're talking about there is sonar, and that's definitely a different frequency band than the infrasound. The, the one thing is the SOFAR channel in the ocean is that sonar, much like infrasound, propagates on global scales even better than infrasound. Uh, in fact, for the, to monitor the entire planet, you only need 15 sonar sensors worldwide, whereas we need 60 infrasound sensors, and you need about almost three, or 250 seismic sensors to do the same thing. It, it's not part of that. The, uh, we're not involved with that whatsoever because it, that's way above what our frequency band would be. It turns out, though, that uh, there's been some both psych physiological studies and some psychoacoustic studies done with infrasound. Um, underwater, which we don't do underwater infrasound, we're just vaguely familiar with the theory, is that sharp bursts of infrasound underwater can cause divers tremendous distress. And one reason in shallow water that you don't want to use infrasound is You've got this bottom, and you've got a surface, and it's smaller than the wavelength. It's really not an efficient channel for it. But if you want to take out a diver underwater, you bash them with a large infrasound pulse. 
generally causes nausea. And that's kind of bad when you have a regulator in your mouth trying to breathe. Um, you can actually, you won't kill divers, but you can take them out of the water where you render them completely uh, useless. Actually, it's weird. That actually doesn't really affect marine mammals, oddly enough. But for some reason, it's tuned for humans. Um, the other thing that they've done is, if Jay had left that thing playing for long enough while I was giving my talk, if this one thing that was done in a concert, a piano recital in England, what they did was they randomly selected pieces in a modern music uh, thing, so it was a 12-tone thing by Pert, actually. And what they did was they randomly bombarded the audience with infrasound during a piano recital. And they got information from the folks about how did you feel during it. And what they found was it wasn't conclusive work, but, and they, they're very free to admit this, but what they found was that if you didn't like that modern piece of music, it actually generated feelings of anger, as in, why am I here? I'm getting mad. If people really liked the modern music, it generated feelings of euphoria. One person said, I felt like I was in heaven. But then on the next piece, oddly, it just left me empty. And it was because the infrasound had been on and then was off. And what they had was, they just had this innocuous looking big tube. It looked like a pipe organ pipe being repaired. Turns out it was a thing to tune the infrasound with a driver and beam infrasound at the audience. So when I was a little kid, uh, one of my favorite things was this book I got at a book fair somewhere. And it was an anthology of horror films. Uh, and they talked in there about, even back in the 1930s, that they would use the lowest stop on pipe organs to create feelings of unease. So real low frequency sounds long ago were known to cause people to feel a little uneasy. Um, today, fast forward a bit, now we've got conspiracy theorists out there. Wind turbines. Wind turbines, yay, green energy. Well, apart from the you know, golden eagles they kill occasionally, but those are just stupid birds, right? So, unfortunately, my friend from the Alaska Bird Observatory is not here. Um, but wind turbines generate tremendous infrasound. They're these huge blades that are 10 meters long that come whapping by a post. They actually are putting them in right now down in Antarctica, about 15 miles away from our array down there. That's, it's actually not that big a problem. We can get around it, we can filter it, but it, it's part of the world. Um, the arrays in California, they have a real problem with it. In Germany and in Central Europe right now, it's becoming a great challenge to find a wind farm free zone where you can actually set up an infrasound array. So the, uh, the thing there is that some groups in England have started to argue against wind farms because they're causing psychological damage to the communities that they're nearby. Personally, I think that is a giant crock and there's no evidence to support it. It's kind of like the uh, you know, cell phones or high tension lines causing cancer, where the, the only conclusive study that I ever read about it was uh, electrical linemen in Sweden, who generally are around a lot of power lines, actually have statistically lower incidences of the cancers that were claimed to be caused by it. So, I don't know. There's a lot of junk science out there, but uh, we don't use the psychological aspect of infrasound. The only thing it does is give me a feeling of euphoria when funding comes in and we get to study it more. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. I Thanks, think we got one over there. No, ah, it's there. here you go. I get paid by the question, by the way, so keep asking. When you talked about the infrasound and the earth seismic, seismic activity, did, does that help predict earthquakes or... Is it already too late when you get the sounds from the infrasound? <laughs> you got it right there. Um, infrasound's not a good precursor instrument, and also the thing is, even if it did signal as a precursor to a quake, you, you hit the nail on the head. The energy from the Earth would get to the seismometer much, much faster. Um, for instance, 330 meters per second, or actually 340 in this room because it's kind of warm, is about the speed of sound. And in the ground, depending on which mode of wave you have, it's anywhere from 2,000 to about 7,000 meters per second, quite a bit faster. It's kind of like being underwater. And actually, this is one thing when you're underwater, if you hear sounds, I don't know if anybody dives in here, but when you hear sounds underwater, you can't tell where they're coming from, and often you always think they're from above. The reason why is the sound speed is about three to four times faster underwater than it is which means that effectively your ears are even closer together. So you're spatially aliased so badly now that you have no idea where it's coming from. Psychoacoustically, you put the sound up and above you. It's kind of like wearing headphones that are playing the exact same thing in each ear. It's like a center of your head sort of feeling. The sound's almost coming from inside you. So yeah, we're not good at predicting earthquakes, but what we are good for is 
telling what happened in certain regions of the Earth when it moves. For instance, if you don't have a dense enough seismic network to look at actual plate movements in certain places, what we had with the magnitude 7.9 earthquake is that our array detected the Alaska range vibrating. In other words, the Alaska range was moving back and forth like a giant speaker cone, and it traversed in azimuth as it went along the range. And that's, that's actually been shown in several studies with the French as well in Peru and in the Andes. We have a question back here. I was curious if um, your studies were related to the room in the new UAF museum where the public can listen to the aurora? Oh. All right. <laughs> Take two on the answer to it, but yeah, we, I worked with that and helped design it and was sort of the science consultant for that, but no, infrasound isn't part of it, unfortunately. There were plans in the beginning, but no, so sorry to embarrass you there, but I don't listen to half these things anyway either. All right, we've got one more here in the front, and then we'll wrap it up. I think there's a guy over there trying to raise his hand too, so. Hello? Hi. Yeah, I don't know for sure, but I remember reading an article way back when about the French were trying to devise this huge whistle and make a symposonic weapon, and it was, it was actually pretty effective, so it eventually lost uh, press. They didn't even say anything about it anymore. Have you ever heard of that one? Uh, no, actually have a bunch of French colleagues and haven't heard about that. The, uh, the U.S. Army actually has the, uh, the MOAS, the mother of all acoustic sources, and it is actually a horn-loaded speaker. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Klipsch in here. I know one person in the audience is, but uh, their horn speakers are very efficient, and what they do is they actually take a supercharged engine and just chop the sound up, but it's not designed as a weapon. Actually, that's designed to simulate explosions cheaply without actually blowing stuff up. Uh, not familiar with the, the French design of a weapon like that at all, but it, it certainly could be possible. Yeah. Are you, Woo. Are you locating with a single sensor? No, and that's the thing that I didn't have time to get in here, but uh, with, with two ears, we're actually really inefficiently designed to actually locate even the plane because there's some ambiguities there in terms of sound speed, et cetera. And uh, if you have two sensors sitting here like this, a wave can hit crossing them like this, and time delay, time delay. A uh, wave that's coming slower can come from a different azimuth and give you the same thing. So what you really need is, if we were built correctly to do that kind of thing, we'd have four ears. We'd have another one stuck on the front of our head, so we'd have a triangle, and then we'd have one stuck on the top of our head, and now we can unambiguously detect in three dimensions. What you saw up there was, is that we have eight microphones at our arrays. And actually, other arrays that we've used, we've had even more microphones. Uh, in fact, we took uh, 12 out down to Fort Greeley. Uh, we have plans now for higher dimensional arrays. What they do is they help reduce the uncertainty in where that location is. With, you can do amazing work with single sensors, but you really can't tell where something is with a single sensor unless you already know something else about it. You need three at a minimum to say just what azimuth did it come from, and then you need four at a minimum to say it came from this place right here. I think we Looks like we're good. Stump the panel here. Well, again, <laughs> thanks for your attention.